Well, hello again everybody. Well, it's actually a few days later since I started having a look at this Perpetuum Ebner record player. And as you saw, we did some mechanical work, very simply by cleaning and lubricating some of the pivots and cleaning off some of the rubber contact wheels and stuff like that. Well, after doing that, the actual speed regulation of the record player was an awful lot better, but it did actually still sound quite poor. Now, I've got to admit, I'm not sure if it sounds poor because there's something wrong with the ceramic pickup cartridge that this thing employs. It could be worn out, I don't know. Or it could also be that after nearly 60 years, a lot of these electrolytics will have dried out and gone bad. It's probably a mixture of the two. So I think what we'll do today is we will actually go ahead and we will uh, use the SR meter to measure the SR and also the capacitance of these. We'll also check the resistance values, see if they're in spec and if there's anything a long way out we'll change it out. But before we start doing that I think I would actually like to do some audio testing to try to find out is it something wrong with the cartridge or uh, is it something else, is it the amplifier? because I'm not exactly sure to be honest. And I also think, much like the previous videos where we looked at benchmarking a radio in terms of its sensitivity, what we could maybe do is do an audio sweep on this amplifier and have a look at uh, how it responds to that. And again, look at the amplifier before we change the capacitors and afterwards to see if we can actually measure a difference. Now, since I last saw you, I've been doing a little bit more digging into the operation of this thing. So we had this switch here. So this switch is actually a volume control and it's also the tone control so I think the the amplifier's got two settings it's got kind of just a basically high and low and that operates by pushing and pulling this switch up and down like that it doesn't actually turn the equipment on and off which is what I thought it was at first so this isn't a power switch it's a tone control so maybe we can uh, just investigate the operation of that tone control later. Now we've also got a socket here which I think I said was maybe a headphone socket which would seem reasonable but as it turns out this is actually um, a microphone input so that means I can use this microphone input to inject some audio into this amplifier and maybe we can see what it sounds like. just had a listen to there with this amplifier being fed with an external audio source. Well, I'm not going to claim it was high fidelity, but it wasn't absolutely totally awful, was it? Now just for fun, let's take a quick look at the circuit diagram. So we've got the ceramic cartridge pickup here, and uh, I believe this is a ceramic cartridge. So the output from these isn't particularly high. I think it's only in the order of maybe 100 or a couple of hundred millivolts. I think the more later magnetic cartridges were certainly produced a much higher output than that. And you can see that this goes in with a 100k resistor and also um, a 500k which is our volume control and it's just interesting to note because it is a volume control it's not a linear pot it's a log pot and I'm going to take a guess that this 100k here and this 10 microfarad input DC blocking capacitor these probably form some of the main audio characteristics of the amplifier and then we come to our first transistor which is just a pre-amplifier or a buffer stage and it's interesting to see that with this combination of uh, emitter bypassing here and also you look at this network here which seems to be applying quite a lot of uh, I would have thought negative feedback to the front end of this uh, pre-amplifier. Now at the top of the circuit here you can actually see that feeding in from the next stage we've actually got this, uh, it's a switch and this 4.7 nanofarad capacitor and also this resistor here, a 51k resistor. So this is the tone control. So it doesn't use a potentiometer, it's not a variable tone control, it's simply got a high or low switch and to make that operate it's basically a push and pull switch which is built onto the volume potentiometer. So the next part of the circuit is a driver stage and then we come on to a phase splitter for what is um, a class AB push-pull amplifier. Now so far so good but at this stage things start to go wrong when we start to look at our final output stage here. Now 
I say it starts to go wrong. Look how the speaker is connected. It's actually connected directly to the collectors of our two PNP transistors. Now, that would be unusual. Now, I was prepared to give them the benefit of the doubt at first look because I thought, well, it, maybe it's a 100-ohm uh, speaker. It's not, they're not using an 8-ohm speaker. So generally, in what I would call the traditional uh, amplifier design of this era, you would have an output transformer because the germanium transistors, they weren't really capable of delivering a lot of current. They had quite a high uh, impedance of the time. Much later on, transistors had a much lower impedance and they could drive loudspeakers directly as we do today but certainly the old germanium transistors weren't capable of driving uh, 8 ohm and 16 ohm speakers so they needed to put much like a valve amplifier they would have an impedance matching transformer but if you look the speaker is actually directly connected to the collectors of the transistors it's not actually being connected to the secondary of the output transformer. What is being connected to the uh, secondary of the output transformer? If you look here we're again via this 100k resistor back to the driver stage we've got an, a, a fairly large amount again of negative feedback being employed but to me that just really didn't look right. Now to try to figure out how this circuit worked I did actually take the time of actually adding some annotation to it and you can see that it actually employs what I would call a positive earth line. So in a lot of modern electronics we're quite familiar with uh, referencing everything to ground but for some reason a lot of German audio equipment especially stuff like Grundig they seem to enjoy using a positive earth line. So again you can see that our ceramic cartridge here normally one side of the screen lead if you like we connect that to ground but certainly not here it's actually connected to the positive earth line i suspect that's got a lot to do with the topology of using uh, pnp transistors rather than npm which certainly i'm more familiar with but again back in the day they used to use pnp transistors because they were well they were the first transistors pnp and npm transistors didn't come on the scene until a little bit later and uh, i'm guessing they would have been more expensive so everything was pnp so if you're working on equipment that's pnp you, you have to become familiar with the use of what i would call a positive earth line so i did actually spend a fair amount of time on the bench with this radio and uh, and a meter and i actually belled out the output stage of the class a b amplifier and uh, what I found was that um, the circuit is indeed wrong. Now, as it turns out, our actual speaker is connected to the output of the secondary of our transformer. And it isn't being directly driven from the PNP transistors, as actually is shown in the manufacturer's drawing. So I'm quite clear on that. It is being driven from the secondary. And these high frequency roll off components are directly connected across the speaker. I have checked that. Whereas before, I think they're actually shown across the primary of the output transformer. Now, the third thing is of interest is the original transformer simply had a, a primary and a secondary. So it had one, two, three, four wires on it, if you look at the previous drawing. Well, if you take a look at this output transformer, you'll actually see that it has, it has six wires coming onto it. So that leads me to believe that it's actually got three separate windings. So it's got the primary, which is connected to the output of our transistor collectors. And again, the normal way. Um, it's got uh, another winding which I've called S2, but it's also got a, a winding which I've called S1. So S1 winding here is actually forming the negative feedback. Well, as you can see, I've gone ahead and I've taken a picture of the circuit board. I guess we can't call it a printed circuit board because it doesn't actually have any printed tracks on it. It's actually just made up of these little riveted connections. And all the wiring between the components is done on point-to-point -point wiring, where things are just like wired onto the little heads of these rivets. So it's not actually a printed circuit board as such because there's no copper traces. So you can see here these two windings here, these are the feedback windings which provide the negative feedback to the driver stage. And then these two terminals here, it's a little bit hard to see them, but the two terminals here are actually where the speaker is connected. From one of the speaker terminals you can see that we take a wire from one terminal 
it goes down and into this capacitor which is the high frequency roll off capacitor comes out of that capacitor goes to that tag there where it joins onto R16 and then we've got another wire here that goes to the opposite speaker terminal so again rather unusual and again unusual for uh, for a lot of a lot of radios and stuff like that the actual high frequency roll off is actually on the secondary side of the transformer not on the primary now going back to the number of windings on this transformer I have actually bothered to actually bell these out and we've actually got three separate windings we've got the feedback winding we've got the output windings which go directly to the speaker here and then we've got another winding which is the primary side which goes back to the uh, ANP transistor stage so without doing any more absolutely exhaustive testing and taking this thing apart I'm fairly sure that the, uh, the actual manufacturer's drawing is actually incorrect and uh, fingers crossed I've got it correct. So maybe again that will save somebody some head scratching should they have a go at one of these in the future. Well I'm afraid even before we get onto any very smart electronic diagnosis I'm struggling with even the basic mechanical things and what's giving me a lot of problems at the moment is this combined volume and tone switch. I've tried to get some cleaning fluid into it because it's very scratchy and it's operating intermittently but I, I haven't been very successful because certainly the switch part is sealed and the, the volume part although I have squirted some service oil into it that didn't respond either so I think what I'm going to try to do and it is always a little bit risky I'm trying to drill a hole in the side of the switch housing and we'll try to introduce some switch cleaner that way Professor Tofts of the University of Manchester puts it like this Well, that seems a lot better. Now, I know at the end of the day, this is a very low cost, and it's not going to be a super high fidelity or low distortion amplifier. It's, uh, you know, it's probably quite bargain basement, and uh, the last 60 years probably haven't been over kind to it. But the reason that I want to do that performance testing on this amplifier is because I want to see if changing out these 60-year-old electrolytic capacitors does actually make a measurable improvement. So that's part of the reason that I was playing those audio clips earlier because again we can go back and we can have a listen to the amplifier before we change out the capacitors and again afterwards. Now I must start off by saying up front that I actually know very little about the testing of amplifiers and especially about performance type measurement. Now of course there's no such thing as a perfect amplifier and all amplifiers will introduce some form of distortion in one way or another. Now there are actually several different topologies when it comes to amplifier design. I said earlier that this one is a class AB but other popular designs include class A, class B and class C. So starting with a class A amplifier design, what you'll find is that the output transistors, they conduct for the whole 360 degrees of the waveform. One of the winning characteristics of a class A amplifier is that they can have extremely low distortion. But the downside of that is because the transistors are always conducting and that they never switch off, they actually consume power and they consume power even when the amplifier isn't actually outputting any sound. So that really makes them unpopular to use in a battery set because the batteries would run down quickly. So the next idea was actually to have a class B design and the class B design looks very much like our circuit and that we'll have two transistors. Now for example the first transistor may conduct for the first 108 degrees or the positive half cycle of the waveform and the second transistor will conduct for the minus part or the next 100 degrees. So each of our two transistors actually only conducts for half the cycle. Now when we have no input to a class B amplifier, neither of the transistors will actually be conducting so it won't be consuming any power from the batteries and that makes them extremely efficient. But the problem with the class B amplifier is this crossover point where one transistor stops conducting and another one has to start conducting. Now what can occur is when one transistor has stopped conducting there can be a little bit of time, a little gap before the next transistor starts to go into conduction and that gap can come across as being audio distortion and they have a name for it which is crossover distortion. But they uh, had 200 millivolts per division here we can actually see that crossover distortion occurring uh, as the positive half cycle when the output is sourcing current it looks fine 
and then there's a kind of a discontinuity in the waveform and then the negative half cycle picks up until we get about to ground again and then that happens again. So what the boffins tried to do is they tried to combine the characteristics of the class A being very low distortion and the class B being very energy efficient and they came up with what they called the class A B amplifier. So the thing about the class A B amplifier is that when one transistor switches off the other transistor has already started to switch on. It switches on a little bit before the last transistor switches off and you can think of that as a little bit like a relay race. So you have a, a relay race and you have somebody, the main runner, who's running along and he's got the baton in his hand and then you've got the guy who's going to come and take the baton off him. Well he doesn't go from a stop does he? You know he doesn't just throw the baton at him. So what happens is the second runner he accelerates up to the first runner and he takes the baton out of his hand so we get this smooth crossover of the baton well that's really how it works in audio terms so one transistor will turn on a little bit before the last one turns off so we get this smooth transition and that avoids the crossover distortion. Now following that explanation you would assume that our class A B amplifier should have very low distortion and of course you're right but in order for our class A B amplifier to work correctly those two transistors have to be biased quite carefully and after 60 years some of those components can go out of tolerance and of course the transistors may not be biased correctly and again that can then lead to this crossover distortion. Now let's take a look at that. So I'm going to use my audio frequency signal generator here and I'm actually going to inject a signal into the microphone input of this record player and I'm going to use my oscilloscope to look at the output. So I've gone ahead and I've set my signal generator to produce a sine wave output. I think that's about about 0.4 of a volt peak to peak and I've chosen a frequency of 800 Hz. Now it's actually more typical to do these type of tests at 1 kHz but a 1 kHz sine wave quickly becomes annoying but you'll find a frequency of about 800 Hz is a little bit easy on the ears. So as you could probably say I had a scope probe hanging off the signal generator so you can actually see the output from the signal generator shown in green there and that's the signal that we're now going to be applying to the input of our amplifier. However in my case I'm not just sticking that signal straight in. Now we said earlier about things like having this uh, positive ground rail and stuff like that. Well as you all know uh, all your test equipment tends to be referenced to earth uh, especially where you've got things like BNC connectors on oscilloscopes and signal generators and uh, what can happen is if you're not careful you can actually short things out because you can actually get conduction paths through the, either the screen lead connecting the oscilloscope or through the screen lead here on the uh, going back to the signal generator and I actually found that it was actually necessary to use this audio isolation transformer so I would say it's generally pretty good practice unless you know exactly how the circuit topology is of your amplifier you don't really want to connect lots of BNC connectors and things like that and scope probes uh, because you can accidentally short things out so I do tend to use an audio isolation transformer so this just goes in line with the output from the signal generator so for this test I've actually disconnected the amplifier from my actual power supply and I'm going to run it from the batteries because I don't want any extra sources of interference or distortion coming in from my power supply wiring. So that's why I've chosen to use the original batteries. And also this amplifier is designed to run from a battery rather than anything else so it's better to use its original battery. Okay so now I've switched the amplifier on you can hear that 800 hertz audio tone and I've also got the uh, scope probe connected to the speed output here. Okay I've just taken a snapshot of that and now we can turn it off because the noise is annoying. So you can see the incoming signal in green to our amplifier and the output from the speaker that's actually shown in yellow here and uh, looking at the two waveforms they do look like quite good representations of each other. So I've just zoomed in now to the crossing point where I would expect to see the crossover distortion if it was existing and all I can see is I'm not seeing anything. And I've also just noticed that I guess we would expect it but there is some phase shift between the incoming signal going into the amplifier and the output signal we're measuring across the speaker. So I think all I can really say for this very quick and dirty test is that I can't see any obvious distortion there. It looks pretty good to me. I think there is a little bit of high frequency noise in places but I, I'm not sure that that's actually an issue and it could just be due to all the long lengths of uh, wire and stuff like that we've got laid out on the bench. 
Now in honesty I don't think that last test was really much of a test because the amplifier really wasn't working, we weren't driving it very hard and uh, that's for two reasons. First reason is because the actual uh, volume coming from this speaker was actually quite high and quite annoying and uh, yeah I've got other people in the house and they don't want to listen to a, an 800 hertz sine wave it very quickly becomes annoying. Um, the other reason that I was keeping the level quite low is because after 60 years I don't really want to risk damaging these uh, germanium output transistors because they are becoming very expensive things to replace but I think it is only fair that we do have a go at pushing this amplifier a little bit harder and uh, before we do that really you shouldn't conduct an audio test in the way that I did it what you should actually do is you should disconnect the speaker and uh, replace the speaker with a, a dummy resistor a dummy load of the same impedance of the speaker now the reason you should do that is because uh, a speaker has a coil of wire in it, it has a, a voice coil and that coil of wire has both inductance and it has capacitance and you'll find that the actual speaker itself has various internal resonance points now those resonance can actually cause distortion because it does actually feed back into the amplifier um, and it can cause problems so to actually test an amplifier correctly uh, you should disconnect the speaker and replace that with a dummy load which is what I'm going to do now so all I've got is these two crop clips here and across these uh, crop clips I've actually got wide in uh, just a hundred ohm resistor I think we'll see if we can just unsolder that speaker connection and of course we don't want this wire shorting out on something that would be annoying and bad so let's just put a Vargo connector over it just to uh, stop it shorting out anything so I've left one of the speaker connections still on that won't have any effect and uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my crocodile clips here clip that on and now I'm actually going to take our scope probe and uh, I'm going to clip this now back across this uh, resistor here if I can get it to go on you can see on the oscilloscope the voltage that we're now measuring across our dummy load resistor so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to goose the volume control now and see if I can just increase the level a little bit oops wrong way So you can see that now we've actually turned the volume fully up on the amplifier we're actually getting some clipping here at the bottom of the waveform the top's still okay but the bottom is being clipped so the top and the bottom of the waveform they're not symmetrical with each other so that is a form of distortion and they do call that clipping so the lower part of the, uh, the sine wave here is being clipped now I've just got the measurement set up on the oscilloscope so it sort of shows that we've got we've got 6.3 volts so what power is the amplifier putting out at the moment so that's 6.3 times 6.3 and we're going to divide that by 100 because we've got a 100 ohm resistor so it's actually clipping at 0.3 of a watt so they do actually say that this amplifier they say it can output one watt it's a one watt amplifier well certainly it's uh, it's actually distorting at 0.3 of a watt so in terms of it, it's not really meeting its manufacturer's uh, uh, expectations there is it now of course what the manufacturers don't tell us is what the distortion level is when it's actually at that 1 watt. What we could do is we can try putting a bit more signal level into it and it'll probably just start clipping at the top. Let's try that. Okay so we've increased the signal level now to 500 millivolts and we can see yeah it is still clipping but it's only clipping at the bottom of the waveform. Let me just finger the transistors make sure there's nothing getting hot. No I'm glad to say that our transistors are still stone cold. Let's put a bit more level into it. So looking at the waveform of a 600 millivolt input now you can see that it's still clearly distorted at the bottom of the waveform you can see the input there it's a lovely smooth big dipper affair but this is actually squaring off and it's now actually squaring off at the top now if we still had the speaker plugged in you would be able to hear that if you've ever heard the difference between a sine wave and a square wave in a speaker if you put a square wave into a speaker it's a really harsh horrible sounding noise so if this was our signal level it would sound terribly distorted okay so I've just adjusted the input level to the amplifier to a point where I can't see that it's obviously being distorted anymore so what we'll do let's just take a, a measurement of the power output so we're, again we're at 5 volts at the moment 
equals 0.26 of a watt. So really, the maximum output from this amplifier undistorted is probably around 0.26 of a watt. Now the other thing we saw is that one half of the waveform, this one, the bottom half cycle, appeared to start clipping before the other side. So what that leads me to be believe is that there's something not quite right with the uh, symmetry, maybe the biasing of the amplifier, because ideally we would really want to try to adjust it so that these two transistors start to clip at about the same point or better still so they don't actually clip but that might not be possible. Now to be able to look at the output from your amplifier is a really useful thing to do and if you're working on an amplifier I would encourage you to plug in your scope and take a look at it but unfortunately one thing your scope probably won't do is actually give you a figure of the actual distortion of the sine wave well, when it comes to actually looking at a sine wave, I seem to remember reading somewhere that they said that most people won't be able to actually spot the distortion until it reaches about 30%. That's one of the reasons why I actually choose to display the input wave along with the output wave because the input wave should be very good because it's coming directly from the signal generator whereas the output wave it's then easy to compare the input to the output to look for the distortion. Now I am just looking at the rise time here and I think I can see a little bit of a wobble in this section but it is difficult to quantify but I've got another piece of equipment that we can take a look at which should be able to help us put some figures to it. Well I've got absolutely no doubt that all you HP fanboys really want to see me slap the 8903 on the bench but I'm afraid you're going to remain disappointed. And today we're going to be taking the Quant Asylum QA401 for a spin. So the QA401 is a computer USB controlled audio analyzer. Now this thing will actually do everything that the 8903 will do, plus an awful lot more. But for me one of the biggest advantages is it'll automatically do frequency response plots and things like that without the need for a GPIB interface and lots of tedious third party software. So as you can see this audio analyzer has a number of BNC connectors so it's got two outputs on it which can be used for left and right and it's also got two inputs on it which again is your left and right channels. Now you can actually see that there's actually two connectors per channel because you can actually use this thing either single ended or differentially and I'm actually using a combination of both. So this is the output connector which effectively is replacing the signal generator so I'm going to be feeding a signal into our amplifier from this output connector here and that's a single ended connection i.e. it's being referenced to ground but the actual connections to the speaker I'm actually using a differential mode here. Well before we get started I have to say that this is the first time that I've used this Quant Asylum and I'm also not very familiar with audio measurements either. So at the moment I'm using the analyzer to output a 1 kilohertz sine wave into the front of our amplifier and I'm actually feeding the output from what would have been the speaker, I'm feeding the output from our dummy load resistor back into the Quant Asylum and this is what's being displayed on the screen at the moment. So you can see on the screen our 1 kilohertz fundamental is being displayed quite clearly there and then you can actually see all these little spurs here, these little points well what they are is they're actually distortion products, audio distortion and what you'll probably find is if we were to look at these I think we can set some markers up these will be uh, harmonically related to our signal here, our carrier if you like so let's just click on one of those so that's probably going to be at, um, I would have thought maybe 2 kilohertz which it is at 2 kilohertz so what will this one be, will that be 3? Yep, that one's 3 kilohertz, and that one's 4 kilohertz. All this is distortion. Now, if I look at the top here of the display, it actually gives us a figure. It's actually saying that this, uh, this amplifier at the moment, with this input level, it's got 4.4%. It's flicking around a bit, 4.5, 4.4. Uh, I'm going to go for 4.4% total harmonic distortion. Now I also have the oscilloscope connected to the output from our amplifier and I don't know about you but I think that that still looks like a pretty good sine wave. I'm not really seeing a lot of distortion. I think they could perhaps just be a little bit there. There might be a little slight bulge in the corners but if I was to look at that I would say well that looks pretty good. Well this is really the benefit of having an analyzer because the actual analyzer can see better than we can and it's actually picking out that there is distortion on these sine waves. Now reaching back far into the depths of my memory I think it's usually common to express bandwidth at the minus 3d point so I'm guessing that the 3db point is around minus 14 here that goes from about 60 hertz all the way up to not much more than 500 hertz 
and you can certainly see that from about 500 Hz it rolls off rather rapidly. So to me that really does look quite poor, but again leave it in the comments. OK, so I've just finished measuring the ESR of all our electrolytic capacitors because I do plan to change them out. Anyway, what I've found is that actually the ESR for all the electrolytics has been surprisingly good. Um, none more than just a couple of ohms. But the other thing that's quite telling is pretty much every one of them, the capacitance value has actually doubled. So this is a 10 microfarad uh, and it's actually, this one is measuring 17 microfarad. It's actually one of the better ones. That, and I think there's one down here that measured nearly 25 microfarad. And we've got one that's 50 microfarad here that's actually measuring 86. So yes, they're all doubling value. But I am quite surprised that the ESR has remained good. So what I'm going to do next is I'm not going to make you watch me change capacitors. I will change them all out and I'll bring you back when we've done that. Well, as you can see, I've gone ahead and I've actually changed out all the electrolytics. I've got another couple of capacitors, this uh, 0.1 microfarad and a 4,700 nanofarad. Well, I did just pop these out of circuit and I measured them both and uh, I've decided to leave them in because they were still pretty much spot on value. I'm sure some of the audio fools out there will appreciate these vintage capacitors. Well, we've changed out those capacitors and we've got the amplifier back on the rolling road. Now you can see the original reading that I made in green here and you can see the current live reading in yellow. And I'm not really sure how to interpret these readings but we can actually see that there's a much steeper and a much more defined roll off now. And that roll off seems to be occurring it's around, I don't know, about maybe 80 hertz. it rolls off very steeply. Now we can see that the overall gain of the amplifier is improved because again the yellow trace is above the green one so we're getting more output now. Now I always thought that the output from an amplifier should actually be quite flat but certainly there is some funkiness going on here. I'm not really sure what's causing that but yeah we can see there's something happening. Now I'm guessing that whatever that is that isn't ideal. Now just going back to the distortion measurements, if anything it does look as though maybe our distortions actually increased a bit after changing those capacitors, which was slightly unexpected, but maybe it's because the amplifier has become a lot more sensitive now. And again, we could be just overloading the front end. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to check what the output is and make sure it's in a similar ballpark than it was before. I think before we had about 5 volts on the speaker when we got our low reading for total harmonic distortion. So I'm going to go back and adjust the gain level till we get a similar output. Well I thought it was possible that perhaps changing those capacitors could have had some effect on the biasing of the output transistors. So I've went ahead and I've just readjusted that. And the way I've adjusted it is a little bit like a side add measurement in that what I've done is I've actually just tweaked the uh, adjustment, the potentiometer, to achieve the lowest total harmonic distortion. And uh, I've actually gained not very much, but I've actually gained 1%. So before it was about 3.9 and now it's about 2.9. So we have made an improvement. I guess the question is, will it actually sound any different? So just taking another look at the output on the oscilloscope, previously I think we did have some little side bulges here. They weren't very noticeable and in fairness I may have been imagining it. But since we changed those capacitors and I've just tweaked the bias on the output transistors, I do think that little bulge does appear to have just disappeared now. Well I'm using my iPad as a signal source and I'm injecting some copyright free music into the microphone input of the amplifier. And uh, well, I don't know what you think, but I actually do think there has been a marked improvement. Certainly it sounded kind of very tinny before and uh, now we're getting a lot more bass coming through. I'm pretty sure I'm not imagining it. It is hard to tell with jazz, isn't it? Because it's not really music. <laughs> 